Yes, thank you all for coming again. Um, I'm really excited about this, and I'm probably going to talk more than I should do. Um, I've been waiting a year for this conversation. Um, Jen and I have spoken a lot over Zoom. Mm. Um, I genuinely thought you were that big, and on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this will go off in a million and one directions, because we just chat. We, go, we have a chat for what's meant to be half an hour, and we're still online a couple of hours later. So um, for those of you who don't know, um, Jennifer Byrne um, is here from Arizona. Is that right, where you're living now? That is right. Um, Jennifer was the Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft. And we'll get into some of that stuff in a moment. Um, more recently, in an astounding 10 months, Jennifer has taken a startup business, grown it, and exited it. And we'll talk about that journey as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome um, on stage Jennifer Byrne. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. So, we are genuinely going to bounce around all over the place. I'm just going to warn you now. So, I thought a really cool place to start is kind of towards the end of Microsoft, if that's all right. You know, you're talking about the stuff you're doing. There's a lot of people here in innovation businesses. But talk about the, the, the innovation work you were doing at Microsoft towards the end and what that, was, what that involved and, and what you were doing and what you achieved. Okay, sounds good. Also, so good to see you in person because Gordon was my COVID friend. Did everyone have COVID friends? You know, you met each other on Zoom. And so it's this uh, post-COVID, oh, my gosh, this is who you were in person. Now I get it. <laughs> so... When you uh, get it, can you explain it to me? Because I don't get it. You don't get it. Okay, well, that's a different problem. That's another, that's another session. Uh, so Microsoft, at the end of my uh, time, there is the CTO of the U.S. business. I ran, um, I ran the technical teams for the U.S., but I also had a couple of innovation programs. And, um, and they were very broadly defined. You're sort of just CTO thinking long-term horizon. How could I... Uh, bring all of the Microsoft resources to bear to grow the business in a novel way or a disruptive way or something that was outside of the normal portfolio of products that we had. And one of the um, areas of the business that was very confounding to us was that we would sell Azure or Office 365, and those contracts, as you sell them, you know, you, you, a customer commits to a certain amount of usage but usage of cloud technology means that a customer actually understands how to solve a particular problem using cloud. And, and we weren't seeing the growth rates that we thought we would and um, had sort of pinpointed it that a lot of it was because there was a lack of digital skill. So you can go sell cloud computing and advanced technology and AI and everything else in your, in your portfolio to a Fortune 500 company, but if they don't themselves have employees who have digital skills and understand how to use technology, then they don't really consume as much as you'd like them to. And so it was this broadly a, how do we think about digital skills? What are the kind of innovations that we can, or innovative programs that we can put into place to, to um, address that? And you start with employees. You think, well, we're just gonna teach everybody Azure. And that kind of works. Uh, but then you realize that uh, to learn Azure, you have to learn a lot of other sort of foundational skills. And so then that got us into universities and schools. And if you keep pulling that thread, you realize that this notion of digital context or fluency has to start at a very, very early age. It has to start in communities. And so to solve the problem at the top level, you actually have to solve the problem at the bottom level which led us into communities where um, we did some work in, in cities like Louisville, Kentucky, Houston, Texas, Syracuse, New York, trying to figure out how do you actually foster the development of skills. Um, and we ended up in a lot of maker spaces and a lot of community funded programs. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we noticed is that this digital divide, if you will, people who have skills versus not, follows a, a socioeconomic divide. So there were, you know, it became a much bigger problem over time, uh, this notion of fluency. And, and that's really what I, um, what I spent really almost all of my time uh, doing at the very end of Microsoft. But what I realized, Gordon, and we've talked about this, is that it's one thing to understand a problem when you're at the top floor of a big company. Um, quite another thing to actually look at the problem when you're down on the street level. Uh, watching people actually, you know, sort of do something and make things and, you know, have the urgency of a, you know, a business to build and a, and a revenue stream to grow. So um, I did think, wow. And, and how does that yeah. work? So you've got a massive organization like Microsoft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you'd think, and there's, there's public organizations here, you know, 
engaging with tiny businesses. Is, is there a culture clash there? How do you make that? How do you get people to engage with some with an organization like Microsoft? So, uh, you, how does Microsoft do it? Yeah, or how are you doing it, really? You know, how are you getting it? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, Microsoft, all big companies have a lot of investment money. It's actually something that I think um, I'm so, always surprised when people don't know this because there's so much money that these big companies give to venture arms or community projects. And, um, and so, you know, there is a purposeful effort to get down into the communities. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you really do have to reach to get there. And, and for, for me, I had to build a proposal and pitch it to my leadership to say, I think that there's a, I think that there is a benefit. If we could get everyone to learn skills, we were able to do some financially mo financial modeling within communities. If you could raise the level of digital fluency in the metropolitan area of Louisville, you could actually increase the consumption of Azure. So doing the right thing at a community level would actually accrue to a benefit to Microsoft. And, and is that how you pitch it? Is like this will like exactly the ultimate revenue it. out? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. But and what about in the community though? Do you, know, you know, sometimes I've done some work in a you know, big thing that I'm passionate about is, uh, and we've talked about this a lot, is getting people from a non-digital economy in, in, in non-digital society into this. Every, every company is a tech company, essentially, right. and that's the direction it's going. Yeah. But sometimes there's a fear of that, isn't there, in a, in a community that people actually might think, oh my God, it's Microsoft, they're going to inject us with bots or whatever mm. it might be. You know, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you overcome that? Well, I think you have to take yourself out of the picture. There's the, the idea of um, for it to be about you, it can't be about you. So, uh, and, and I would, like Microsoft's a huge company, Google, AWS, they're all doing the same thing. Where those programs are most successful is where they're not, uh, they're not providing branded services. So Microsoft isn't telling you they're going to teach you Azure, because clearly that's for Microsoft benefit. And it is a narrow set of skills, but where Microsoft gives dollars to communities and lets those communities spend the dollars as they see fit, uh, that's really where you see uptake, right? Because people don't feel pigeonholed into Microsoft. And, and at the end of the day, uh, goodwill has a ton of value, corporate value. And, and obviously we could talk about this forever and it'd be a big branded advert for Microsoft and maybe they could sponsor us next year. But um, <laughs> let's go into you, you coming out of Microsoft. You, know, you, yeah. you achieved some massive things there and you know, people can chat to you about that off stage. But why, what was the ultimate thing? What was your... Um, unlock moment. What was it? Now it's time to go to go and do something else. What what prompted that, and and where where did the journey go? What was your next adventure? When you're the CTO of a big organization, you have so much access to interesting people and interesting conversations. Um, but what you don't know, and I realized this when I was spending time in communities, is how to build something from the ground up. So it's a, it's a very different skill set to operate a large P&L than to actually, you know, do the block and tackle work of having an idea, vetting the idea, testing the idea, pitching the idea, supporting the idea. That's just a very, very different thing. And it felt kind of like noble work, if you will, um, and hard work. And so I thought at Microsoft, number one, I played out the corporate career. Uh, so where else was I going to go from there? I knew how to do that job, and um, but certainly wasn't had a lot of work left in me. So, <laughs> so what would I do? Um, and it had to be something very different. And I was inspired, frankly, by all the people I was meeting in, in communities who were building businesses and, and starting their own ventures, like many of you, um, and thought that would be a great next adventure. I've always had this notion of what's the next adventure in my career. Um, and I wanted to do that. I also thought the digital skills thing was very, very interesting because of the socio socioeconomic divide uh, and that the underserved portion of the wage force really doesn't have structural or systemic support to build careers and to achieve digital skills like the top half of the wage force. Like we all have LinkedIn, which is this free platform that allows us to advertise ourselves we can understand in our peer groups across different industries or in our role type, um, how to talk about ourselves, how to write a resume, what skills, just because we can look at each other, right? And people connect to us and it's wonderful. And so for, for the upper half of the wage scale, it's very easy to understand how to become even more digitally fluent and therefore have more personal equity. Uh, if you're a lower half of the wage scale and you don't have any of that, 
how do you how do you do something? I mean, you're really kind of at the mercy of, of whatever programs might come along to fund you or support you. There is no LinkedIn platform. Um, there is no understanding, therefore, of the ROI that you might achieve if you took a digital marketing course. You know, if you're a secretary in a, in a company and you want better pay, you're going to go get digital skills, but which skills? And what will they get you in the end? So I felt that this sort of digital divide was um, was a problem we're solving, and it would be fun to solve it not from the top floor, but really kind of down on the on the ground level. I love the fact that every time we talk about anything, you go, "It'll be fun too." Even when I asked you to come over here, you <laughs> went, "It'll be fun too." Your life is kind of geared around things you enjoy doing. When you, I mean, coming out of Microsoft, the level you were in Microsoft, you must have had a million and one offers of different. I bet you've had a million and one offers around here. I bet people have been pitching to you in the last 24 hours, like you wouldn't believe. What was it you looked for in a business, you know, when you were in that journey thinking, what's next? What, what, was, it, what was important to you? What did you look for in that, in that company? When I left Microsoft, I decided I would do a little consulting, which I did, and that I would focus my time uh, doing advisory work for startups that were broadly in the future of workspace. Um, you know, it's a blend of, uh, it, it's so interesting, the decisions of, uh, about what we do in life, I think should always be, what do you want to do with uh, what does the world want from you? Or what does the world need right now? And if you can match those things up, that's the inflection point. So what do I know how to do? I know how to sort of create strategy and business and technology within the tech space. I know how to bring a tech product to market. That's my skill. And then, you know, so that's what the world, you know, needs. Um, and what do I want to do? I want to go solve a problem around access to really great employment where employment uh, really is digital. You know, most jobs will change. We know the storyline about how most jobs will change and everything's going to become different. Whatever you're doing now will not be what you're doing in five years. Digital skills have a shelf life of about three years. You know, that's a problem to solve, and I can solve it through my ability to run tech. So that kind of got to the place where I thought, well, I'll go do advisory work, meet a bunch of companies, and, um, and one of them had a platform they were building. They were trying to become a tech company themselves, but they had a platform in the future of work, talent, acquisition space, and um, so I joined them. But we met on a board of a business. We did, yeah. With a guy who now sells watches on the internet because he sacked Jen because he didn't agree with her decision, which I find astounding. That's a whole different story. <laughs> but, you know, so looking at that, or when you, know, you narrow it down, that's the field you want to work in. That's yeah. the, the thing that you want to achieve. Yeah. But why that one company? Why did you, th what was it about that? You know, if, if cause you choosing what you're choosing will be similar criteria to a VC backing a business, which a lot of people will be here, or a corporate backing a business. So yeah. what were the kind of specific criteria you looked at about the organization? The company had a platform and fairly, fairly simple model that serviced the lower half of the wage scale and helped them through a mobile app find work. Right. based on skills. And so very, very um, different notion than if you're going to go out to Indeed and apply to a million jobs. This was an app-based uh, service that allowed you to build your profile, add your skills, add your employment, add your availability, all of that, sort of create um, a view of the kind of work you want, and then it would match you to jobs. So um, I thought it, was, it had potential to be um, to solve that problem of lack of access to jobs based on what it is you're able to do for a portion of the workforce that I think we ought to pay attention to. Um, also, the company had started as a staffing agency and had built a, a technology to service that line of business through COVID, realized staffing was not going well, uh, but they did have this nice little piece of technology that they thought they could take to market and had no idea how to be a tech company. So mm. I was able to bring those skills to, to the table. And talk about the people in the team. So had they recognized that they'd become a tech firm overnight and they now needed that skill set? How did they know what they needed? In the, in, did you help them guide what they needed as well? Yeah, well, they didn't know. I mean, they wanted to be a tech company and they had a piece of technology and didn't know how to take it to market, didn't know of what that was. And so I was hired specifically to uh, transition them into a tech company. And talk through that journey, you know, that transition, talk about the culture change that probably had to happen and the structure mm. change. Talk through that last 10 months that 
you don't think was Ugh. quick? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, every single thing um, from marketing and sales to, to value to how you structure a technical team, how you take something to market, how you design it, how you scale it. You know, the product was built for a very narrow, um, it was really built for retail and events. So what is the kind of design thinking analysis that you bring to that, that uh, conversation so you can expand the applicability of the platform to different industries? So we went light industrial, we went call center, we went medical. Uh, but you know, like anybody building a, a, a technology, you start very narrow, right? Typically start, start out very narrow, you have a single problem, it's very discreet, there's a lot of value in that. And that's what people will invest in, right? VCs want to hear a really nice, well-bounded problem and solution. Uh, but to grow to scale, you have to scale that across a lot of different um, you know, audiences and models. And that, um, that process requires a different kind of team structure. It requires a different kind of analysis. You have to get very real about having product people and developers and having you know, an, 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 a version of what a go-to-market strategy should look like, channel, all of that. Right? But that's so, got to be different to doing that in Microsoft. So you've got infinite resources in Microsoft and yeah. take them externally with high salaries, I assume. Doing that in a startup to scale up model, when you say you had to design that team, mm -hmm. go into it in a bit more detail for these guys. You know, yeah. What did you design and where did you start and what did it look like in the end? What did we do? Uh, well, <laughs> you want me to get to the nitty yeah, gritty, the behind the curtain, yeah, 100%. The, the dirt, yeah. Uh, we had to uh, rethink about roles. You know, founders were doing, we had two technical founders and one business founder, uh, and they had these nominal titles. One was a product guy, one was a tech guy, uh, but neither one of them had needed to understand all of the sort of the things within those domains. Like the product guy wasn't really doing product work. He hadn't really gone out and done a lot of market testing for the product. He hadn't done pricing sensitivity analysis. He hadn't done, um, you just hadn't run customer workshops, hadn't thought from a long-term horizon. You know, there's just a lot of things in that product domain. So we, I actually had to hire some people to come in to teach him how to do a, the job of a product manager. And so we walked him through that analysis, you know, how do you figure out feature prioritization schemas, all of it. It's a big, it's a domain, right? This is, people have that as a career. So we did that work. The developer had to think about um, getting a lot more formal in how they develop. You, when it's just one guy writing an application, there's no notion of COGS, right? There's no notion of, you know, is it the best design for 100 customers? And so we had to replatform on Azure uh, we had to think about refactoring using you know modern technology, microservices, serverless architecture, because that's how you scale globally. We had to think about security, right? So how do you you know manage that if you're going to go enter a market in the UK or Europe where you've got bigger GDPR requirements? So there's just every little bit of discipline that you would normally find in a company like Microsoft at a microcosm. You still need to bring down into your startup land. And how easy was it to get the founders to get that? Because there must have been a lot of stuff they didn't know they didn't know at that yeah. point. How did you do that? <laughs> I mean, you know, every possible way. Right. It's a, you, there's, that's not an easy question because you know, everyone start, comes at it from a different place. Um, our founders were willing. Uh, I, think, I think maybe the answer is that they, you have to know what good looks like. Mm -hmm. so, Possibly that's what I did was to bring Microsoft view of the world to them simply to say, you know, you're building, you're building, you're building, but what are you building to? Here is a picture of what it looks like when you get there, and that became the North Star. So for Tom, we had to say, look, this is what a platform that really can operate at scale will look like. And so then he's got a kind of a, a view of that going forward. And did he have that vision of what that needed to be, or did you have to... We've both been in businesses where yeah. what people think they're going to do and what they're actually going to do are yeah. a million miles apart. Yeah. Did, did you have to bring that out of him or did he, did he see that before? I think it was a journey. It was a, you know, in every conversation we had to really think about where we were going. So that's kind of becomes your anchor point is somewhat in the future, if you will. And, and every conversation was bringing us along there. There was also a lot of organizational structure. Startups are fun because everyone works around a table and you know it's very casual as it needs to be. When you're trying to get bigger, you have to have roles and segmentation of responsibilities as well. But um, part of that was 
you know, how we set up our meetings, how we set up our reviews, and in the context of those meetings, you know, it was always about what does this company need to look like? What does this platform need to be in order for it to be viable in market? That makes sense. And, did, and, and who else was involved? So you got two founders. Yeah. Three founders. Was it three founders? Two founders? Three founders. Then yourself. Who else did you bring in? Uh, we had a customer support team. We had salespeople. We had um, solution architects that were working with customers post sale. They were, they were all brought, they came in after you came in. They all, out. well, uh, yes, half, about half of them came, m more developers. We outsourced, so we have a, a company in Ukraine that did a lot of our mobile development. I, am, I had architects, nearshoring architects and engineers in um, Costa Rica, Argentina. So we had a pretty big team at the end there. And that's obviously something pretty big to manage as well. How do, you, how do you go about doing that when you've got it such, you know, from such a rapid growth, how do you manage it? How do you make sure that's sustainable? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's your whole, whole life, Gordon, as you know. <laughs> Um, I mean, no, you bring people on very thoughtfully when you're a startup, right? There's always a kind of a lean, a lean approach. And, um, and we were, self, we had one of the founders was our, also our funder. Okay. So that was very, very helpful. So we didn't have a big tranche of money that we had to kind of spend down. We had somebody who was regularly uh, investing in the business. But because of that, we were very thoughtful about every single role that we brought on. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times it's a go slow to go fast kind of scenario. It's very tempting as when you're in that startup world or any new business venture to go super fast. Mm -hmm. And and you always hear founders saying, oh, I have to keep a few minutes ahead of the business. I've got to run really, really fast. And um, I actually think there is a go slow to go fast. Be a little bit more thoughtful about the roles that you're bringing on. Spend a little bit more time scoping them. Spend a little bit more time getting your team involved. Uh, so that when you do make those hires or add to your team, you've done it really well. And then you typically don't have the friction or the gaps that, um, that you do when you go fast. And I think that's the thing we've talked about a lot all through today and it will be through the rest of the day is actually having a purpose design, mm. you know, f physically thinking about what your organization's shape needs to be yeah. rather than just going hiring. We've all seen it where people just hire tactically. Oh, I need to sell more, I'll hire a boat of salespeople, I need to develop more, I'll, and then yeah. you end up with an organization that's just too big and unwieldy. Yeah. But when you're working with a founder, and a founder who's a funder, mm -hmm. how do you manage that? Because surely they just want to go, 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 and you're coming in and putting something around it. So, I, I mean, I got really lucky because the, the non-technical founder, um, he had hired me to be um, an advisor to him and a consultant to him. So we already had that trust relationship. And he, um, he didn't know technology. So he was uh, able to trust that, um, you know, that we were going to make the right decision. So that was actually, that was actually great. I think, um, it is hard to describe to people who are not in tech space, you know, what that model looks like, right? The ramp to build when you're on a pay-as-you-go model, um, you know, sort of how revenue comes in is hard for people to understand when they're not in the space. And so we spent a lot of time just trying to educate on tech industry, on every platform that ever came before us, what that looks like as you build, you know, what your customer usage models ought to look like. So you have the ability to kind of understand whether the forecast is healthy or not. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of education along the way. And what about your own education? So you've been in a big organization, mm -hmm. and as you said, it's massively different from going, there's not a lot of people, I would say 90% of people who work in big corporates can't survive, can't thrive yeah. in an early stage of a startup business. What were the things that you had to learn about yourself and things that you had to change from going from a Microsoft into a startup? Yeah, I mean, it's this uh, chief cook and bottle washer thing, right? Where I'm like, I can't believe I'm making these slides. I can't believe I'm doing all this work. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of work uh, when you don't have a staff anymore to do it for you. I think it's probably the hardest piece of it. Um, but what did I learn? Like, you, you refresh your skills. You know, anything you don't know how to do, you learn how to do really quickly. I've never been a finance person. And all of a sudden, I had to figure out, you know, how to run the finances of the company and, um, and modeling. So, um, so you do, and I did have to, you know, close a lot of gaps in my own skill set. Um, I had to do a lot of the work on the ground. I think it's really important, especially coming in from the outside, to be the person who's ready to do the most menial task. So I 
did try to brand myself, um, you know, like if there was just, I needed a deck for a, a customer meeting and no one had time to put the graphics together, I put the graphics together. And then you show up and you're like, I did it, people. Uh, you know, and, and that's, there's some credibility in that. And, but so. is that built in you? Is that, were you like that in Microsoft where you were just doing it, so even if you've got a big team, or did you have to think... God, I've just got to do this. Well, no, because the, the, it's the very opposite thing in big companies. To go up into leadership roles in big companies, you actually have to learn to stop doing. That's a critical thing. I mean, if you're going to go be in corporate America and you're interviewing for a, a leadership job, they're going to test you on your ability to not do because you can't scale across a team of, you know, however many hundreds of people if you are the person who always feels like they have to get in there and do. So the privilege of becoming an executive at a big company is you actually don't know how to do much of anything before. And that's probably why so many of them fail yeah, yeah. in startup land, because I don't know how to do any of this, but I know how to tell other people how to do it. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I'm really mad PowerPoint skills right now in Excel. And skills then right as now. you go through, so you talk about start a bit, but then you scaled it, right? So you've then got to go back that other journey the other way and start giving it back up, I presume. Yeah. And, and actually, but when it's, I know it's not your thing as a founder, but it is your thing. You're, you know, you, you've seen this thing grow from tiny to yeah. your stamp on it. You know, how do you then start letting go again? And who do you surround yourself with in, yeah. to, to be able to do that? Yeah, I didn't have a hard time letting it go, just to, to be honest. Um, I hadn't been in it very long, a year and a half. We, uh, we were positioning ourselves to raise another round. And I will say, in all honesty, like the startup thing is very, very hard to do very hard to scale, a lot of work. Um, and we found ourselves in a market that didn't have the multiple to raise the way we wanted to raise to build a truly aspirational platform. So we would have been successful. We would have been at a slower ramp. And I thought, do, do I want 10 years in this company just kind of building it a little bit more? Or do I want my next adventure? So, you know, so I, um, we, we found somebody last July or they found us and and the acquisition, you know, sort of moved from there. So I didn't have a hard time giving it up. I'm also that, you know, your time horizons change, your expectations for how long you want to do things change as you go in your career. And I know, I know for sure you know this because you're doing the same thing yeah. where you're like, okay, what's my, the, like, I want adventures that are two years long at this point in my life, not 10 years long. So... Uh, so this was the right time for me to, to hop out and I'll go do live hire for a little while and then I'll hop out and I'll do the next thing and the next thing. But what about the founders? You've, who, well, where does that Two of them are coming over to live hire right. in the acquisition uh, and they will stay. The, the do, part of the acquisition is that the, some of the equity in the transaction comes to us after the integration of the two platforms is complete. So they'll be on for that. The third founder um, will take a big long break uh, and uh, recoup and recover. But going back to the conversation, yeah. one morning you woke up and gone, do you know what, it's time to get out of this. It's, you know, it's time to do it. Was that you who came up with that idea and do you have to convince them? Or was it, where, where, where did that conversation That's happen? so hard because they, uh, the technical founders had built the platform. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, yeah, that's a tougher thing. And I didn't anticipate how emotional that would be. You know, from a career in business, you build products, you sell products, you build products, you sell products, and you wake up one day and, you know, your company's changed the name of a product. Microsoft had Skype, and they didn't have Skype, and then they had Teams, and then they had all, you know, all of that change. You're not, you don't get sentimental about your stuff. But when you build it from scratch, you do. And that, it did surprise me how much Tom and Jeremiah um, had this kind of emotional reaction to sell in the company and will the product live on? It's like their baby. So, um, so that was, that was tough. And, um, you know, people just go through their emotional things the way they do and you respect the process, right. And, and, um, and help them through it and help them see to the extent you can, why it is a good thing, um, for the company and for the product itself. And, uh, you know, I think mean, these guys will process for a little while, uh, and then they'll get to go new, do their next thing. So, <laughs> And what about from a financial perspective? Were you all aligned? Did you know this is what we're going to sell it for? Or was the differences of, you know, imagine again the emotional side of if you're emotional about a product, you probably think it's worth more than it is? That was tough. Um, I guess if in reflection, the bit of advice I would have would be if you've got technical founders who have not done this before, 
uh, educating them around market, how markets value technology and different markets value technology um, is a good idea because I think these guys had to play catch up you know, to understand, well, how are you selling it for that much money? We thought we were going to make this much money. And we're like, well, it's not exactly how that works. So there's this thing called a multiple. And, and look, we did this in a pretty terrible climate as well. So starting last July and just finishing now, we understand the cost of money is, you know, crazy right now. Valuations have gone down. The VCs are, you know, they're starting to uptick again. And there is money in the market. But, it, you know, there was a heyday a year ago, and so I think these founders had to really reset their expectation mm -hmm. around what you could have gotten if you'd sold it in, you know, early 2021 as opposed to when we did that. So, you know, but it's an ongoing conversation. You you know, you talk to your founders all day, every day. So it's uh, it's not like a weekly check-in. They they understood. But it is a, it was a, like rapidly changing. I mean, in summer last year to oh autumn. I mean, it was just like that, wasn't it? Of valuation. So, so scary. Yeah, absolutely. It's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. And, and, what, and, and when you're going through that and you're looking at, I mean, was it always going to be a trade sale? When, when you'd made the decision, we're going to get out of here. You, you said the money was hard. You were originally looking for finance when you were going to bring in v, more VC money. Mm -hmm. And then was it, yeah, let's just go and sell this to did you yeah. know who you were going to sell it to? What, talk us about that, the exit. Or... I mean, we did get a little lucky. We had a company who we talked to a year before, uh, and they were very interested in a core component of our platform. We weren't ready yet. We hadn't been to market. Uh, and they came to us a year later and uh, had some urgency in their own business okay. to fill a competitive gap. Uh, and, yeah, it was a little bit of a, you know, you have that moment. Like, we could go raise, and we could go be our own thing, or we could go take this deal. The platform was great. The culture of the company was great. Uh, so there was a lot of that alignment immediately. Uh, they were in Dallas. They're an Australian company. They were in Dallas. We flew out to Dallas, met their, uh, their C-suite, and, um, you know, hit it off. You know, lots, it's people tell the people. Yeah. And so the people thing worked really, really well. Um, and it just... Uh, in the end, it was uh, it was a slow decision, and then it was a quick decision. Right, and was that purpose thing looking at the culture of the acquirer? Did you did you think about that or huge, huge? Yeah, they're a, a very popular company in Australia. They do talent acquisition as well. They have a wonderful DEI story, which I think is great. Um, I like the founders. Uh, they have a really interesting market expansion opportunity in North America, which is great for me. Um, and they're just good people. You know, mm. you like them. Right. So, yeah, that helps. So talk about the next. You're going to stay with yeah. it for a while, aren't you? You're I going. did. As part of the acquisition, I agreed to take on the role of chief product and technology officer. Uh, and what does yeah. that look like then? What's the next you know, post? I think a lot of people, the last slide on their slide deck of when they're pitching for money is yeah. exit. Yeah. But exit isn't the last step, is it? There is that journey beyond, there's life beyond exit. What, yeah. what does that look like? What's the next I don't time know. in the business? What's your biggest challenge you're going to face, do you think? You mean in live hire? Yeah, when you, for the next six months. Well, I'm taking on a team of people. So uh, very one thing to build a team from scratch, you get to assemble. And you know, these teams, when they're newly assembled, think of themselves in very specific ways. There are a lot of sort of existential, who are we? Uh, when you take over an existing team, that's a very different thing, right? You've got some uh, existing culture. You've got a lot of stuff that's already been there. And so, um, and yet, there's always opportunity to transform and to grow. So it'll be a very interesting and thoughtful approach, I think, to respecting the thing they've built. A little bit of humility to come in and not be the loudest voice in the room, I think is very important. Also, um, to think about how you make fundamental transitions and transformations of the team. So they are also in their own journey trying to figure out how to scale you know, there's scale from zero to a million, a million to 10 million, 10 million to 100 million. I remember uh, working at Symantec, uh, John Thompson, who's now the chairman of the board at Microsoft, but he was the CEO of Symantec, and sitting in a meeting with him, this was 20 years ago, and, um, and he got on stage and he just said, it's a thing for businesses when you get to a billion dollars in revenue, and you can look at the history of all sorts of companies, tech and otherwise, and it's always an inflection point in how you have to change who you are and how you operate at a billion dollars. It's a magic number. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that was really interesting. And I think it's true, actually, at other breakpoints 
in revenue as well. So this company is trying to get to the, they're at an inflection point as well in trying to get to the next thing. And so the, the ask from me is how do you help us transform this team in a pretty fundamental way so that we're ready to scale to the next level. So, you know, and I've always thought when you're trying to make those big changes, um, the, you have to look for the two to three things that you can do that create the biggest change. And you don't do that unless you really listen well and are thoughtful and take yourself out of the picture to kind of watch the dynamics of the team. So I'm doing a lot of that. And, um, and it's fun. I love the people side of it. I love the opportunity to transform. And I think I'll probably do that for until I know I've done everything I could do yep. for live hire, and then I'll go on to my next thing. But that's that thing, isn't that ability to diagnose where we are now, where we want to get to, and how we're going to get there. And that, that's what you're amazing at, is that ability to then put the plan in to be able to achieve that. A lot of people don't. They just go, oh, we just need to do that and run. That lifting yourself out and thinking, this next inflection point, where do we take this to? We see that in, if you look at early, really early stage businesses, that often means bringing people in, like yourself, like the, like the founders have done. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a tough question, I think, I hope. So I'm a founder of a business, and I need to bring in someone who's been there and done it. I need to bring a gen burn into my business to grow my business. What's the biggest challenge for me as a founder bringing you into my organization? I mean, probably ego. Right. You've got no ego. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got ego. Uh, I think as a founder, you have to let go of your own ego. You have to, you have to think that you're doing something that's much bigger than yourself, right? It's the only way you can convince your own self to move out of the way. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to bring me in, you're bringing me in to do things that you quite de by design cannot do yourself. Why else would you bring me if you could do it yourself? Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of, you know, admitting I, I have a deficit in a certain area where I want someone else to fill in. So I've got to move my whole ego out and let, let someone else come in. I think that's tough. It's a simple thing that's also a hard thing. And I think when we've talked about this before as well, is that clearly we talk a lot. The, um, <laughs> the, the, we've talked about this before where what we see is making a really successful entrepreneur and a successful founder is knowing when to step aside. Mm -hmm. It's knowing that actually my work here is done. Mm -hmm. When you've been doing your advisory role and mentoring people, how do you help them to know that's the time or that's the thing they should move, move away from? What advice would you give people here on that side of things? I think if you ground yourself in what you want to do, there's a positive way to ask a question and a negative way to ask a question or, or look at it. Um, you could look at it like, well, what can't I do? Should I move on because I can't do that thing? That's maybe where you start. I don't know that it always ends well because it's hard. We all have so many insecurities anyway, right? We've all got imposter syndrome. If you're starting a business, you probably spend a lot of your day thinking, I don't deserve to be here and I probably won't be successful and this is terrible and hard. What was I thinking, right? I mean, that is a, just a talk, to be real, it's a talk track that we all have in our heads. And so if you come at it from that negative perspective of, oh my God, there are these things I don't know how to do. I need to get someone to come in and do it. I just don't know that leads you down a very happy road. If you come at it from a mission-based perspective of, what are my strengths? What do I really know in my heart, in my mind that I know how to do and want to do and think I you know, maybe have some skills at doing and it's this direction? Then anything that's not in this direction is maybe, you know, that's not in line with my core passion, my core purpose, maybe that's where I need someone else to step in. It's that, um, that book, Good to Great, Remember, the, remember that yeah, book? Yeah, and the whole premise of it is that you have to understand your core competency. Businesses who have focus on core competency are always successful. And if you diagnose what happens with a lot of other companies, it's where they went beyond their core competency and sp started investing a lot of their time and resources in areas outside of their core business. Yeah. Right? So if you think about yourself as a business, if you stay within your core competency, then it doesn't hurt your ego so much when you have to bring in somebody else who is a little bit outside of that. And I think that's a great line, think of yourself as a business. This is what I do, this is what I'm really good at. I might enjoy doing that. I have um, people that I work with, and, and I think it's a really smart thing to do, is have people who are your critical friends, people like I can ring you, and nine times out of 10 they say, don't be so bloody stupid. You know, that, that's my don't be so bloody stupid crowd who say, <laughs> I'm gonna set up a big event. And they go, don't be so bloody stupid. They didn't this time. But you know, having those who remind you and bring you back on track, because particularly for a lot of 
it's kind of fast start or quick start founders, and I know there's a lot of them in the room, is you can get sucked into things you like doing as opposed to things that you're really, really good at. And I think that thinking of yourself as a business is a great piece of advice. Thank you. And what would you do? We've got very little time left, but going back now 10 months, I still can't believe it's only 10 months, but going back 10 months, what would you have done differently if knowing what you know now of taking the business through the journey it's just gone through? I think I would have been more steadfast in my understanding of the company value. I think we were in a tough market, and uh, when you're negotiating with other company, it's easy to negotiate away. Not that we didn't get a good deal, but I always wonder if we could have gotten a better deal. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We're getting booted off. We could talk for hours as we normally do. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for coming over to the UK. Thank you.